Hi, so I'm not sure what all I'm going to talk about this video, but um, the target or the focus of it is going to be on this um, Epson PC486GR that I got a couple months ago. Um, I did a video on making a video adapter for it. Um, I think in order to show you that adapter right now, I would have to unplug it from the system. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, so um, there's my adapter. It worked first try when I plugged it in. Ended up actually giving the adapter I made in that video to a friend of mine. Um, and then I made another for myself. Actually, I made two more. One of them is in the opposite direction, so I can uh, run it into a VGA splitter and then into that, um, well, you can't see it, but there's an OSSC, like a digital scaler back there, and then feed that from the OSSD, OSSC into a capture card to put it on the screen so you can see what I'm seeing. Um, so yeah, that's um, those adapters worked fine. And um, yeah, I just, I know I mentioned that I was going to do another video, but I wanted to wait for my friend to, uh, to see me unboxing it. And that happened, and that was all fun. Um, but it's been a couple months and nothing's happened, so here we go. Um, Again, this is not going to be a very directed video. I'm, I'm extremely sorry if people want a short, like, okay, this, how do I do X video? I might try to put timestamps in the summary or description, maybe, but I just can't guarantee much. I can tell you, however, that if you're trying to find something specific, I'm also working on a blog post, which I think you may find helpful. Um, So, yeah, um, my site's just hosted on GitLab and GitHub, actually. Um, but a nice huge article, which is mostly talking about the um, PC98 and compatible systems. So I'm trying to make this sort of as comprehensive as I can um, and a look into the system and a whole huge info dump for English speaking users since there's not a ton of documentation on these things in English. Um, it's better than it was 10 years ago, but still not great. And um, especially for the Epsons, um, it's kind of challenging. So yeah, like I might have implied just now, um, the Epson PC486GR is in fact um, not a P IBM compatible, but it's an NEC PC9801 compatible computer. Um, PC9801 is a platform that NEC developed in Japan. I'm going to move to um, a different lens so you can see a close-up. I could actually just... Um, switch to my kit lens which lets me zoom things in but you get a stronger like better zoom with this prime lens um, like it goes in closer and also I just like manual focus prime lenses from the 70s and 80s a lot so it comes with the territory all right so let's focus in on the base of the system. So, um, yeah, I got this in the box um, off of a Mercari listing in Japan, um, M-E-R-C-A-R-I. Um, I was very happy with it. Um, it was listed as junk with a description. It worked when it was put away like many years ago or something like that, but in Japanese. Um, so, plugged it in, turned it on, hey, it, it just works like it used to. Um, it has um, an upgrade sticker on it, um, saying that it's been upgraded to a 486DX2, 50 megahertz. Um, however, I discovered that to be a lie. Um, it was probably true at one point, but this is actually, it's not just been like someone ripped out the 486DX2 to sell it separately or something. No, it's not like that. Um, it actually has a DX4 in it, so um, or D yeah, DX4, I think. So um, I'm going now to open this thing up and just kind of show you what it looks like inside. 
switching back to the wider shot. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a little tour inside of the system and there's not, I'm not going to like tear it down just to the motherboard all the way because that takes a while, but it wasn't that hard to do. So I don't think people should feel too intimidated by the idea of doing that. Um, it's kind of hard to get a good picture of the screen when it's turned on, so it wasn't just showing all the CRT flickering artifacts constantly. Uh, I had to manually, well, I have um, alternative firmware on my camera, and I was able to set the frame rate to 28 or so um, frames per second. So like, uh, basically as close as I could to an integer division or integer um, divisor of um, the 56 point whatever kilohertz, I'm mean 56 point whatever hertz that this monitor normally runs at. Um, but that's just kind of a side tangent. Um, so currently I'm going to be uh, taking this monitor off of here so I can show you around inside. The monitor is um, an NEC PC KD851 which is actually meant for a PC-8801 computer, which is kind of a predecessor, um, spiritual predecessor to the PC-9801, um, using a Z80 CPU instead of um, a 16-bit Intel um, 8086 or similar CPU. Um, so it's very heavy. Might be my heaviest um, CRT monitor in this uh, size. The, um, the 70 pound um, Sony PVM um, 20 inch takes the cake. Uh, so yeah, there's you might see there's um, a separate box here. This is just my external hard drive unit. Um, this has a SCSI controller and um, there's a SCSI drive in here. And yeah, so there's no internal hard drive on this. Some of them came with one, but this one did not. So, uh, let me see, where did I put my screwdriver? Oh yeah, here it is. All right, so, um, according to my friend who um, got a PC-98 at about the same time that I did, um, only, only she actually went for a real PC-98, um, like NEC model, rather than the Epson clone like I did. Um, she was able to take hers apart um, with only thumb screws, and I'm a little jealous of that, so I might uh, try to find some thumb screws to replace these Phillips heads back here. But I have to undo uh, one, two, three, four, five, five Phillips screws in order to get um, down to the belly of the beast. I'm also going to unplug everything. Yeah, okay. Um, MIDI. So I'm just going to tell myself blue um, MIDI chord on the right, my right, yellow MIDI chord on the left. This has a MIDI interface in, uh, plugged into it right now. It's a very complete setup, I think, from what I can tell. Uh, there's a couple things it doesn't have, but there are things that I've not seen very much call for. I'm, I'm sure there's software out there that could use like the Sound Blaster style card with an OPL chip, but um, and like that that's more like the Western cards, so it uses the 15-pin IBM style joystick port and stuff. But um, while I'm sure that I could find something to use that, I haven't yet. So for now, I'm feeling pretty good about things. Okay, so the screws are out. Yeah, so I'm going to put these screws inside of that tape. That'll work. So now, oh yeah, I need to do the side screws. I'm gonna move the mic, sorry about the noise. So yeah, in addition, there are four more screws 
uh, different sized screws and um, they have a different head shape on them so it's um, hard to mistake them for each other uh, holding it on from the sides of the case Trying to avoid another trip around to the back. Since it's mildly annoying. Hopefully you can still hear all this okay with my directional microphone. <laughs> we'll find out, I guess. Okay, so... That's done. Now... And pop the lid off. All right, so yeah, it just pops right off after you've done all that. Not a lot of friction or anything holding mine on, which I'm very happy about because my AT&T, I have an AT&T 6300, which is basically an Olivetti M24 computer um, with an 8086. Uh, that thing does not like to open up and will fight you every step of the way and make you feel like you're going to break it. Um, all right, so let's take the keyboard out of the way now. Uh, yeah, this is a rubber dome keyboard, by the way, that the Epson came with. Um, some earlier models came with mechanical boards, both from NEC and Epson, but this one, which is uh, a PCKB8 model, um, is not mechanical. However, while I'm on that subject, I do have a PC9801 NEC keyboard, which uses NEC oval switches, is what people call them, uh, white NEC oval switches. So they're the linear kind, not the, um, not the, uh, clicky kind, like the APC computers used here in the States. From what I can tell, um, NEC never sold anything with the blue oval switches in Japan, which are the clicky ones. Uh, maybe someday I'll find that I was wrong about that. Okay, so let's try to move the camera up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> sorry about the mess. Just had finals week, and I'm not in the mood to think about cleaning right now, even though I know I need to do it. This is my unwinding time, or something I do that I, I consider to be unwinding. Um, yeah, there we go. Now let's brighten it up just a hair. And move the legs so that they aren't in the way for the tripod. All right, there we are. Um, got that repositioned. Uh, you can see relatively well now. And I can always rotate it to get you a better view. So, um, this is the side where most of the magic happens um, in terms of how the computer works. Uh, let's see, focus. That's about as good as I'm getting, I guess. Um, so there's, this looks like two cards, it's actually, um, they're sandwiched together and it's just in one slot here, but there are one, two, three slots here, plus you could consider this a fourth, but it, there's a riser board in it for all the expansion cards in the back. Um, the, the PC probably only came with, um, well, the riser board, one card plugged into it, which was a high-resolution board, which I actually don't have. So if anyone reading this happens to have an Epson 486GR and doesn't want their high-res board, um, I would love it. Uh, there's not much use for them, from what I can tell, since uh, the high-res PC9801 models, like I think the 9801HA was one, um, aren't completely compatible with the regular operating mode, so you need to program stuff specifically for the high-res systems. And um, they use a different address, um, well, they dif use different addresses for things. So um, due to the lack of backwards compatibility, it seems like people say it's pretty useless, even on the Japanese internet. Um, 
I've done a lot of research on the Japanese internet about this. So here, this is the CPU card. Um, you might be able to uh, tell from that if you're looking at one in person. But yeah, there's a 486SX on the back here. Um, notice also, this is just kind of amusing to me, all of those bodge wires. It's so like the blue wire here, the red wire, uh, this little blue wire, this gray wire, and this gray wire. And um, did I miss any? No. Okay. So yeah, and one of them feeds down um, through a hole right here. This is actually a hole that's been um, made, and it goes to the other side of the board. It's kind of funny to see. Um, anyway, so I've opened up this board sandwich before. Uh, there's not too much to talk about in there, so I'm just going to skip right to the other side, which is the cool thing. Um, so this listing that I went for didn't list specs or anything or say what cards were in it, anything like that. It did have some cards in it though. And um, you could only see the back ones. There were no internal pictures to go by. So I didn't know what the CPU was like or anything. But yeah, this is a PC486 um, DX4 from what I can tell. Um, there was some mutterings on the internet, on the Japanese internet, that it could be something like uh, AM586 or maybe even the Cyrix586 um, CPU. But mine, I'm almost certain, is a 486DX4, which is a little bit slower, but I'm not too disappointed, honestly. Um, so for most of this video, I'm probably going to remove this chip, um, but I might have to put it back in if I want to play Toho or something. So um, yeah, Toho games are one of the reasons people get a PC-98. Um, they're pretty fast-paced um, space shooter type games. Um, yeah, so... Oh, also, um, NAC PC-98s um, use their own format of RAM, so you can't just put regular like SIM RAM from an IBM compatible into one. It will not work, and it might actually cause damage, like fire or popping things, you know, just bad things. Um, Epson ones also use a non-standard pinout, but they probably won't catch fire or something if you put like IBM RAM in one of these. This is Epson RAM, which is annoyingly hard to find, and um, like one of the Japanese sellers that has it like refuses to work with any proxy service or like anyone outside Japan. So I consider that xenophobia and will say shame on you to that person, but um, Maybe they have a, another better reason, and I'm just ignorant of that. Maybe they had really bad experiences or something. Uh, so yeah, oh, all in all, this has like 12 megabytes of RAM, um, counting the four on this board, which um, this board um, did not come with this machine. Someone added it, but it was in there when I got it. Um, it's a Buffalo ERB 4000... Um, ERB4000 um, virtual 86 EMS board. So yeah, it gives you more memory, the expanded memory specification. And um, it doesn't have RAM in either of these slots, but it comes with four megs on board. So that's nice. Um, oh, also, um, if you're looking for an accelerator card, which is what this is, because there's like the fan and there's a voltage regulator so you can use it. If you're looking for accelerators, um, they're often called geta on Japanese sites because like geta are the Japanese wooden shoe. I can actually just show you a picture of one of those. Um, let's see if that does what I hope it does. Yeah. So you can see the little um, the little um, posts or boards or whatever you're gonna call them blocks on the underside of these shoes. I think the idea is that um, well, looking at this, you can oops, wrong ring there. Just trying to get the focus ring. You can see that there's like a layer um, between the pins and this base area. I think that's why they're calling it a geta, because it's like a shoe that sits on top of the uh, circuit board, or on the bottom of the circuit board. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to leave this off for a while because some things actually run too fast with that in. And that's why I'm actually thinking of getting another one of these things, except I spent so much money on this that I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, actually, no, I'm going to put it in. There's one game that I was going to show you that really does work better with it out, but it doesn't, like, break with it in. So, should be fine. It just um, runs faster than it's supposed to. But it's not, like, ridiculous if you um, set the CPU speed down to the minimum that it will allow, which, um, the one nice thing about the Epsons that the um, PC-98's lack is a switch on the front panel that lets you select between three different speed settings, so high, medium, low. And um, none of the NECs that I know of ever had that feature. You could change the speed in the BIOS, but not just on the fly like you can do with these. I just think that's really neat. Um, if you're having trouble getting a card to be detected or like the system's not starting or it's not seeing your RAM, you might have to push down a little bit harder than you really feel like you should have to on the board here. Another thing to note about taking these apart, all of the screws, like, so all the interior screws are the same, um, except for maybe one, but like basically every interior screw is the same as every other interior screw. Um, and in mind, they're all brass colored and none of the exterior ones are brass colored um, or have these little, uh, well, this is kind of small, maybe you won't be able to see it on the camera. These little teeth on the washer, I don't actually know what that thing is called. A uh, retention thing, whatever it is, it's um, probably meant to stop the screw from coming back out. But yeah, so all the interior screws are basically the same as all the other interior screws, so it makes it easier to remember what goes where, because there are a lot of screws in this thing, especially if you're taking it down all the way to the bones. Um, but yeah, so the 486DX4 should get me 75 megahertz instead of the 50 megahertz that was advertised on that sticker on the front, which I think is neat because that's the difference between not being able to play Toho at full speed and being able to play Toho at full speed. And I had not even bought this with the intention of playing Toho, but it's nice to be able to do that. All right, here we go. Bought it as a cultural artifact as much as anything else. And also because American 486s are so expensive that, I mean, the base cost of this computer, not counting all the cards and crap that I added in later, um, was um, not too different of a price than an American 486 PC would be in working order, um, even after you're counting shipping in. I think I paid like $60 or so for this. Um, might be a little off on that, but it's close enough. Okay, so the RAM card's in, the CPU card's in. There's actually two RAM card slots, but I don't have one in the second slot there. Um, I'll show you the expansion cards I've got in the back here. I do not have the high-res board, but if you don't have the high-res board, you can use that slot for an additional CBUS card. Uh, PC-98 uses CBUS, um, the CBUS instead of like ISA, ISA. Um, and so their cards, Handily, you don't have to open up the computer to actually get to pull them out or swap them but they're rather large cards and This one's a MIDI interface so I can uh, Use external MIDI equipment with my computer uh, This one let's focus that back in This one is um, a PC 9801 86 board which is a board made by NEC for, um, that has a Yamaha 2608, um, no, that's not, this is the Yamaha 2608, uh, the Yamaha 2608, uh, chip on it, which is an FM 
synthesizer chip in the OPN series. Uh, the closest you might have heard, if, you've, if you're not already familiar with Japanese computer stuff, probably is the FM chip in the Sega Genesis, which is an OPN, uh, I forget what the actual model number is or model name is, but it's some variant of OPN. This is OPN A, uh, the 2608, and it's like an expanded, it's an expanded version of the 2203, which was built into this computer. So there's actually Yama, another Yamaha chip on the motherboard here, um, but it's down pretty deep. Um, Games will call this 86 sound, and they'll call like the 2203 ch cards and like computers with 2203 built, 2203s built in. Um, the, they'll call those 26 sound because the PC 9801 26 was the name of the card um, that NEC made that had the 2203 chip on it. So there's some history for you. This is just a blank card slot cover. Um, that's where the high res card was. You probably can't see it in the uh, stream, but the third slot down here is actually a different color and the pins look different on it, and that's because they are different. Yeah, you'll probably notice that th this looks more golden than this does. The pins in here are more like they are in something like an AGP slot, actually. But um, if you aren't using something that needs that extra bandwidth, like the high res board, then you can use that um, as a third CBUS slot. So, then there's slot 4, and this just is my SCSI controller. I had weird luck with another SCSI controller card that came with this thing, so I ended up buying this to just see maybe my controller card's the problem, or my termination's the problem or something, or the termination on the SCSI controller card is the problem. And yeah, this fixed everything. Um, so my guess is that the other SCSI controller card I have, which I can just reach down here and grab. Um, that's a graphics card. Oh yeah, here's an 86 card I got that doesn't work. <laughs> it needs um, replacement of basically every capacitor on the thing, and I don't have a hot air station, so that's just sitting off to the side for now as a project for another day, then maybe I can recoup some money on it later. Uh, 86 boards are getting expensive, so if you can, I'd actually recommend, unless you have a good reason, buying a computer that has integrated um, 2608 chip. Um, yeah, so here's the original SCSI controller um, board that I got. It's by Tiak. It's um, the IF55TB, and yeah, so EPROMs. <laughs> um, there's the controller, the Western Digital thing here. I'm guessing this is for the CBUS interface and connects the Western Digital um, SCSI controller to the CBUS. But anyway, uh, I don't see any voltage regulator chips on here, which leads me to believe that's not actively terminated. Um, and I don't have any passive SCSI terminators. Um, and all of my SCSI cards are SCSI, uh, SCSI drives and things are SCSI 2. And I'm pretty sure SCSI 2 requires active termination. So there are, however, um, two black bar things on the board, which are resistor packs, which are like the other way of terminating a SCSI bus. Um, and my belief is that maybe if I have passive termination on one end and active termination on the other end, that might cause issues especially if it's not supplying um, termination power over the card, um, over the port here. So anyway, SCSI is kind of a nightmare, which is probably not a surprise to you if you've used old Amigas or other things that use SCSI um, in recent years. Um, it was probably better at one point. Uh, yeah. Alright, so put that card away. You gotta put the um the dead 86 board away. Um this is a graphics card that I don't think I showed earlier. Um it's the GA 1024A, which should allow for 256 colors um in 640 by 480, I believe, for Windows 3.1 or Windows 95. But um, you don't really need it for 
basically anything in DOS. Apparently there are a couple of erotic games, um, like, um, what would you call them? Like visual novel type games on this system that can use this for 256 colors within DOS, but that's not really my forte. I think it's forte. Is it fort? I don't know. It's not really my area of expertise. But yeah, so this is a cool card. Um, also, you need to do pass-through, I think, on it. So if you've ever had a Voodoo 2 graphics card, you might understand what that means. So basically, you have a two-dimensional graphics card that like outputs a two-dimensional rendered image, and then you feed it out of there and into this connector, or the CRT in connector. Um, and then from there, you can overlay the whatever's being rendered on this card on the picture and then send it out to your display. So I just think that's kind of cool. I'm also guessing that for the 480p mode, it might actually output to a different monitor than for um, the these connectors, which I'm guessing are for the native um, 640 by 400 that PC98s like to use. By the way, that makes uh, finding a monitor for these things a real pain, uh, unless you import, and the importing will kill you on shipping, even if you get one for like 30 bucks or something. Uh, so, yeah. I'm not sure I'm doing that right, because you have to put a lot of force on it to make the board actually pop in. Uh, make sure that your card is lined up with these plastic rails on either side, and you can just kind of try to wobble it and see if you've done it right. Yeah, that one went in easier. Uh, there it goes. Alright. Um, I don't actually have enough of these thumb screws, but all these cards are supposed to be able to be screwed down to the system. Someday I'll get thumb screws for it. Probably from my friend in um, another state who I've been talking about who got ended up with like three or four PC-98s. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, I'm just here with the one, and I'm trying to keep it that way. Other things to note that I'm just remembering now, 100 volts AC is um, the power supply that this thing expects. And um, there are two ways, well, there are a few ways to do that, but I would not try to run it off 110 or 120 volts, whatever, or whatever your country is. But, like, in America, it's around 120 nominally. Um, it might work, but I just don't know if it'll work, and usually I hate fear, uncertainty, and doubt kinds of things, which is what I'm doing here, but, um, it really is better safe than sorry if you're importing something like this because of just how much shipping is, I mean, and I don't actually see these on, like, Yahoo Auctions and Mercari all the time. There are often one or two up there, but I've gone long periods without seeing them before. Um, specifically this model. Seems like it's a desirable model. Um, yeah, so this is a power transformer, a step-down transformer that can go to 100 um, volts, um, maximum 330 watts. The wattage listed on the back of this thing is... Let's see, 160 watts is what it's listing. And then the monitor, I forget what that is listed at. But anyway, so I got this, but there's also another one that I got, which is, in my opinion, the one you should actually go for. But this will add like another $100 or so to uh, what, you're, what you end up spending. So, yeah, here's my, um, oh, let's fix that. My Sanyo um, step-down transformer. I believe, but I'm not sure that this is that this is a fully isolated transformer, um, which should mean that I don't need to ground it externally. That this should be enough here. Um, Japanese power cords, by the way, don't have a ground pin, so um, if you're trying to do an earth ground, uh, you'll need one with this little thing, and you'll need to confirm that the third pin on your PSU, if you even have the third pin, is actually. Um, in continuity with the shell of the computer, and in my case it is, so I'm good there. Um, alternatively, there is a ground screw here that you can unscrew and like put like a lead on and ground it like you would an old turntable or something in the U.S. 
Uh, but yeah, this one I like because it has two ports and it's good for 1,500, um, no, 1,100 volt amps, which are basically watts. Um, apparently there's a difference. I don't know what that difference really is. Um, I've tried to think about it from the engineering standpoint, and I can kind of guess it has something to do with the fact that at different voltage, like outputs, the um, wattage, well, you, you need different numbers of amps to get the same wattage, um, depending on what the voltage is. So that's my guess there. But yeah, I like this thing. It's Sanyo TSD N11LU. There's also an N11L model, I think, or maybe it's an N11U model. The, that should also work fine. Mine just has a little capacity um, like indicator light to tell you how much power you're drawing, which um, usually isn't enough for it to even light up, except for right when the system is starting up. Uh, okay, so I think I've gotten through all of that for the moment. Oh, also these two outlets on the back um, feed through power. When you hit the power button up front, then these activate, and so if you plug in your PC monitor into this port, and it will accept 100 volts. Don't do it if it doesn't accept 100 volts. Um, and then you have that just switched on permanently and you hit the power button on the computer itself, then your monitor automatically comes on for you. So that's kind of nice. Anyway, I ended up using um, the two ports on that other transformer for um, the monitor and, well, for the, um, for the system itself uh, actually, there, I'm only using one port on there right now. I'm using it for the system, and then I'm daisy-chaining the monitor through it. But I've also plugged my phone charger in, because my phone charger can work at 100 volts, and it was just an easily available outlet. Um, this thing, uh, which I'm not sure is grounded the same way, it doesn't even have a ground pin, actually, on it. Um, I do have a use for this as well, um, because I have a Roland synthesizer that uses a 100 volt like Japanese power brick. And I could replace that with like an American one that runs at like the nine volts that it wants, which is basically like the Famicom and, and um, the Mega Drive and uh, the US Genesis I'll use. Uh, I could uh, use one of those bricks, but I, I kind of am trying to keep it original. And uh, not to buy more power bricks than I need because I already have too much stuff. And I already had that step-down transformer. So now it serves a purpose. Okay. Just plug that back in. I'll, ta I'll get to talk about the Roland um, stuff that I have eventually. Um, for now, you might see off in the corner there, um, there's a little yellowish glow or greenish glow not sure what the camera really is seeing um, that is my MT32 which is one of the two units that I've got okay so I think I'm done here basically oh yeah floppy drives so this originally came with um, two three and a half inch floppy drives um, some of them came with two three and a half inch floppy drives plus a five and a quarter inch drive or just two five and a quarter inch drives. Um, there's a jumper on the main board that lets you select how many drives you want to use. Um, and it's set to two right now from the factory. The tape on here is just because I stole the um, brackets to mount these um, GoTech floppy drive emulators on. Uh, but yeah, so these things are a little funky. They um, have a ribbon cable on the back that breaks them out from this laptop style connector to a five and a quarter inch conne um, connector style. And uh, so the brackets need some spacing that isn't provided by most um, 34 pin IDC to card edge adapters that I found. So I had to uh, make my own spacers. And uh, those look a little funny. Uh, a little funny. <laughs> um, yeah, I would recommend not doing it like I did it. This is kind of just, I refuse to spend additional money. I'm going to spend an hour while I'm talking on the phone with someone instead to make this. 
uh, but it, it just connects all the wires from point A to point B and it's just a straight through extender and then I connect um, this little five and a quarter inch adapter thing onto the end of that uh, so okay I had this mounted like this upside down I'll focus it back in sorry about that um, I had this in upside down so this needs to go like that okay so yeah it just ends up being an extension to the GoTech drive which is really a three and a half inch drive but it's a more standardized one um, the adapter boards I have for the 98 I mean for the Epson or whatever don't actually um, they don't actually what's the word I'm trying to use what am I trying to say even um, yeah they, they um, those don't actually have a um, they don't use the normal laptop drive pinout so even if you have like an adapter from a laptop drive uh, you can't just use that so I've not been able to get away with using the GoTech um, with like the GoTech model that uses a laptop style drive connector the 26 pin uh, flex cable is what that is okay I think that's all plugged in correctly I guess we'll find out right um, <laughs> so yeah and I needed um, a Molex to uh, Berg connector adapter as well the four pin adapter thing I know it's not really just called a Molex connector but I'm using the terminology that real humans actually use for this kind of thing uh, oh yeah also on the side here this is where the hard drive would go if I had an internal one uh, this is just a blank mounting plate but if I had the hard drive card there would be a SCSI um, external interface um, connector here and um, additionally there'd be a hard drive mounted on the card sitting within the case right about here and um, yeah I don't have that card uh, this computer did not come with it some models did mine did not um, so I have not seen one for sale online when I was looking so I ended up using the SCSI um, controller in the C bus slot like um, most people on the internet were um, and like this owner originally had done the previous owner originally had done uh, I think now that's probably it for the inside of this computer um, yeah there's an integrated speaker on it woohoo there's um, a miniature style it, it's the Centronic style connector but it's not the regular size one for a printer uh, this is actually a floppy drive connector here a 100 pin uh, floppy drive connector for using external floppy disk drives because this uses a Shugart interface rather than the um, IBM interface which only allows for up to two drives so this allows for four total which is cool so I'm intention I'm intending to eventually um, get some five and a quarter inch drives externally for this thing but not yet or maybe just an external housing that will hold the Gotex and then I can put the three and a half inch drives back in internally uh, which will make it look a lot nicer okay so putting this back together now there was a brief hard view, hardware overview. Oh, it has these feet on the side too, so you can use it like a tower case if you so desire. I do not so desire, so I will not. Even if it would mean I don't have to lift up the, uh, the uh, monitor whenever I want to open this computer up. Okay, oops, that side's not secured yet.
Yeah, thumb screws like my friend has would be really nice. <laughs> if I get a message from that friend, I'm probably going to stop this video, but... I'll mess around with this in the meantime while I wait for that to happen. Uh, also, I'm noticing that the light outside is getting dimmer, so I'm going to turn on some interior lighting. need to be that bright just yet. There we go. All right. Um, up a little. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing an audible buzz when I use this dimmer. Hopefully that's not carrying over in the microphone, but I don't trust it, so we're going to use overhead lighting, and maybe in the future I will um, remove the dimmer from the circuit. Okay, so I know it's that dimmer because this isn't the first time that's happened. I just haven't had it happen in a while. There's just one more screw. Yes. Okay, so we're going to be getting into the meat now. Uh, in all likelihood. Ah, come on. There it goes. So yeah, um, other ports on the back, uh, I can mention before I flip it around, there's a mouse connector here. Um, so PC-98 does not use a standard like PS2 mouse or anything. It uses a bus mouse, um, and it uses the 9-pin D-sub connector, which I believe, but I'm not 100% sure, is the same D-sub uh, pinout that the first Microsoft um, bus mouses used. It's like the green-eyed uh, mouse, for anyone who knows what that is. I think that used this connector pin out. And um, I'm guessing that's because ASCII was highly involved with NEC when they were designing the PC-98 series. Um, and ASCII is, was basically Microsoft's Japanese um, proxy at that point, or liaison. I don't know what, what I would actually call it. Um, there are adapters to let you use um, mini DIN D, uh, bus mouses, which is actually what I'm doing. This is a Logitech um, PC-93-MD mouse. And uh, yeah, so this is on a 9-pin D sub from a later um, PC style bus mouse from before PS2 mouses really took off. Um, it uses those. You can also modify the pinout on, on other quadrature mouses like Amiga mouses or um, Atari ST mouses, I think. Maybe even Apple ones, um, pre-ADB Apple ones. You'll see a lot of ADB stuff if you're searching for bus mouse online, so that's not the same. So don't let it fool you. Even though it's called Apple Desktop Bus, it is um, not the same bus. They're, the bus mouse is probably talking about the internal um, card bus interface. Okay, so blue was on the right, and yellow was on the left, I believe. Good thing I emphasized that to myself, or I would never remember. Uh, 
plugging in the monitor adapter. Um, I've got a serial. Yeah, the other connector I didn't mention was the RS-232 um, DB25 connector. And then there's also a digital RGB connector, which uses a, I believe that's an 8-pin DIN connector on it. Um, the, uh, you want to use analog RGB if at all possible, because digital RGB will not give you as many colors. But um, yeah, my NEC monitor that I have for this thing uh, that I was lifting up off of this earlier sports both digital and analog, but on the digital one it's using um, I'm, what I'm going to call a VTR connector because I don't know what the actual terminology is um, for the real name of it. But um, so videotape recorder connector is what that means and it's and that's a um, it's from old broadcast equipment it was used a lot for that but apparently Japanese PCs also often used it for digital RGB and I don't have a cable for that and the connectors seem to be hard to source and I also have no need for it because I have analog RGB which is better anyway I would only even say digital RGB is acceptable if you're only playing very old games um, from mid 80s and earlier maybe uh, I don't have a this real exact date that I can give you for that though okay so where's the power connector did that fall yep that fell okay so I am digging down underneath here now grabbing the uh, power cord. <sighs> okay, I think it's gonna stay in place now so I can get up above my desk and go back around and plug it in. Yeah, here we are. I marked all of my uh, PC-98's cables with um, blue painter's tape and marked them as 100 volts so that I wouldn't accidentally um, use any of them for powering anything else. Then I also marked the plugs on my actual hardware um, to uh, remind myself that everything here is using Japanese 100 volts AC. 50 or 60 hertz shouldn't matter because there were two power grids in Japan and um, one of them uses 50 hertz and one of them uses 60 hertz. So basically everything designed there um, technology wise either has two versions which is not common at all and wasn't even in the 80s anymore from what I can tell. Nah. Or it's capable of working at both 50 and 60 hertz, which is more common seemingly. Okay. Monitors on top. Gotta plug the monitor's video cable in for analog RGB. Yeah, if you're interested in what a VTR connector looks like, um, you can probably just search 8-pin VTR connector and you'll get it. And uh, note that that's VTR, not VCR. Um, all right. So, let's get down into the meat for a little bit. Oh, actually, I can put the lamp back on the table now. <laughs> that doesn't have to stay on top of my PC case anymore. Now that this is back, 
in its position. So, okay. Now we can get down to the meat of things. Um, with apologizes, apologies for the weights. Maybe I'll cut those out of the video. We'll see. Since I was talking all this time, maybe there's useful info in there. Um, lowering the tripod again. started and back that out just a bit there we go now to continue oh I'll show you VTR connector while I'm here um, this is what I'm looking at so this site's calling it a Honda connector. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. Here's the socket. Um, it's not the thing in, in the red circle. It's the thing in the green next to it, um, ironically. Because in this case, this is probably carrying composite video, but the digital RGB thing is right next to it just to make you confused. But in Japan, it seems like the digital RGB was carried over connectors like that. Um, Okay, so yeah, um, we can go back to this now, put the tape away since we don't need that roll sitting there anymore. Um, oh yeah, the SCSI controller also, you might have noticed, uses a somewhat odd connector. It's not actually the 50-pin um, high density connector that you might be used to seeing on Western devices. Uh, let's see, can I brighten that up a bit? Yeah. Um, it's not this connector. It's um, like a miniaturized version of the Centronics connector rather than a miniaturized version of the D-sub connector. So, all right. There's also one thing you can't do with this particular keyboard that I've noticed, and it's worth mentioning. Um, I don't know when this changed, so maybe there's some later mechanical keyboards. Um, basically, there was one generation of mechanical keyboards after this one that NEC made at least, and that one did not have latching lock keys like this does, where like you press it and the key stays down. Um, but like that last revision that did not have the latching keys, maybe that doesn't do this. But this PC9801V board that I have, which is from one generation before then, um, will not let you configure or use the SCSI controller, um, which in my case is software configured instead of by using dip switches like a lot of stuff uses. Um, so... It's good that I already had the Epson board um, and had already done it, done that configuration before. Otherwise, this probably would have been really hard for me to figure out if I'd only had the mechanical board available. Um, so, yeah, the thing you need to do when you turn it on um, to access the SCSI controller, which in my case is an LHA301 um, by Logitech without an H at the end. So, can I find a nice picture of it? Yeah, one of these. And the 301A uses a like, Western style high density uh, 50 pin connector, but the 301 non-A uses the mini Centronics as well. Anyway, this card right here um, is my SCSI controller and Logitech without the H ambulance going by. Um, yeah, so that card um, is what I'm talking about. A lot of SCSI cards um, just have dip switches on them and don't have a software configurator. 
And it's nice that this one does have a software configurator, it, since dip switches and, inter, and IRQs and stuff are still confusing to me. But, yeah, actually some of the Toho games would not work because of um, an IRQ setting that was wrong on one of my cards, which was fun to figure out, to say the least. Anyway, so here's how you get into the menu um, for the Logitech LHA301. Um, and I found this information from um, a Japanese website somewhere on the internet. Um, it's probably linked in my blog post, actually. But you hold Control, Graph, and L while it's booting to do that. Um, also, to enter the software like BIOS setup menu, some PC98 models only had dip switches for like setting up the BIOS stuff as well. But um, later ones like this in the 9821 series of, from NEC had a software um, BIOS setup screen. So um, to access that, a lot of systems you can hold help while it's booting. This one is no exception to that. But some earlier Epson models and maybe NEC models, you would hold control and graph without L um, while it was booting as well. And I think either one actually works here. So I'm going to try holding control and graph. Graph. Yep, that works. So um, CRT is still warming up. The CRT is from like 1986. Oh. Uh, do I need to fix how something is plugged in? It's seeming that way. Crud. There it goes. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay, so that VGA connector was not screwed in. Haha. Uh -huh. All right. So yeah, this is the um, software configurator screen, um, and I got in here by holding Control Graph. But just to show you, it can also be done the other way. Um, hit reset and hold the help key, which is on the numpad. Um, yeah, so this also gets you here. A uh, bunch of settings. Maybe I'll go through these at some point. Um, some interesting ones. Uh, the graphic display controller. Switch it between 2.5 MHz clock speed and 5 MHz clock speed. Most games seem to want 2.5. Um, I've yet to encounter a problem with putting it at 5 megahertz, but it could happen. So just know that if you're in trouble, try changing that to 2.5 megahertz. The uh, NEC setup menu looks a little different, but has a lot of the same options in it. It's opening a soda. Uh, and it spilled a little bit. Dang it. Okay. It overflowed just a wee bit, but it's annoying. Aren't my streams entertaining? Aren't I so professional? I really don't want to get professional. Like, even, even if I end up making money off this channel, which, I don't know, like, I'd love to not have to go to work and, like, to be able to do this, but... We'll see if that ever happens. Anyway, whatever the case, I don't want to stop being myself on this channel, regardless of what happens. So, if that ever happens, call me out on it. <laughs> so I don't want to stop doing things like this just because it's not good optics for the camera or whatever. <sighs> Needed that. Okay. So... <clears throat> other interesting options uh, by the way this here um, this line of text and the one for number one and also the one for number seven here um, that's system reserved the first is system in Japanese that's the katakana for system and then apparently this means reserved or something like that but I am terrible at kanji so this is just what I think is true. Uh, this switch here, um, the first word is memory, memari. Um, a lot of this stuff has katakana words that are just English transliterations, which is convenient. Um, but yeah, this one um, sets if the system zeroes out the memory at startup, I think. So it's like initializing the memory or not. 
and its current setting it is um, initialized in the memory and if I flip that then it changes to nai at the end um, which is like a way of negating something in Japanese and so that means don't initialize the memory. Um, uninitialized memory can't have any value when the system is turned on based on like just random chance and static electricity and like radio frequency interference and whatever. Um, and that's actually why if you switch on NES with no cartridge in, um, sometimes you'll get a different screen color um, than other times. So yeah, that, that's just because of the initialization state of some RAM somewhere within the graphics processor. Before the software that loads puts it into a known state. Okay, so in this third area, um, this is possibly the floppy drive terminal mode, which is an interesting thing that only NEC computers have, so I'll see if that's what it is. Um, so the floppy drive terminal mode, if I do that, then it should boot up to a different screen momentarily. Let's see. Oh, nope. Is it going to actually load the SCSI controller? Maybe that, maybe that isn't what this was. We'll wait and see. <clears throat> if the hard drive light starts blinking, which will be right about there, then I'll know that. Ah, okay, so... Nope. Um, there we are. So let's go back in here and flip that back, since we don't know what it's doing. Uh, this one changes the floppy between high density and not high density mode, I guess. <laughs> so like double density or something. Um, actually 640, that might be lower than double density. Uh, whatever, um, PC-98 is a little weird with those. So um, this is high density mode the way it's set right now. Um, and PC-98s use three and a half inch disks um, running at 360 RPM like a five and a quarter inch disk would and sectored like a five and a quarter inch high density disk. So. Um, you can swap a 3.5 inch or 5 and a quarter inch drive into a PC-98 and it will not care. Um, some later ones can also read 1.44 megabyte floppies, which makes the drive run at 300 RPM. But um, otherwise, it will use the 5 and a quarter inch format regardless of the size of the actual disk. Um, so... Yeah, th that's kind of convenient. It also makes it a little hard to transfer or burn write floppy images, uh, but it's not unovercomable or insurmountable would be a nicer word, a nicer, more real word. Um, yeah, you can use USB floppy drives, some of them, to uh, evade that, but anyway. So that's um, the one, one megabyte mode. This is something related to hard drive DMA. Um, this, I believe, makes the system use 500, the first 512 kilobytes of RAM as conventional memory, instead of allowing you to use the whole 640K, or 640 kilobytes, not kilobits. <laughs> um, where was it? There is a terminal mode somewhere. Yeah, here it is. That's terminal mode. So, um, two, four in the second set switches, which I don't know what it means because kanji. Um, oh, and you have to use the enter key when you change a setting here. If you use the escape key to get out of this menu, it will um, drop whatever change you just made. So be sure you hit the enter key to go back into this side, uh, the left side screen, and then hit enter on that one, hit enter there. And um, now, it, yeah, so now in this mode, if you connect to the external floppy drive connector on the back and run the cable from this Epson to another PC-98, so that can be like an NEC one, it can be another Epson, whatever, 
um, you can use this machine as an external floppy drive for the other machine. So like this way, if I were to connect a second Epson PC or something, or an NEC PC, I could plug drives into the flash drives into these GoTeX slots here, and um, the other PC would boot from them, which I think is awesome. And um, no NEC models apparently ever had that, so that was just an Epson thing, and not all Epson models even had it. So, pretty cool. I talk about it a little bit in my blog. Um, but that was something I did not know about until I got this thing. So yeah, we're changing the setting back. Um, apart from that, oh, this is the sound BIOS, which you have to turn off if you have an external card plugged in, apparently. Uh, and this is also something related to sound. I think this one like enables the sound card, and this one is the one for initializing the sound, um, like enables the internal sound or disables the internal sound. And this one um, is for enabling or disabling the initialization code for the BIOS, I mean, for the sound. I don't know if that's true, so do not trust me there. Like, it, I take no responsibility if like this causes loss of life or something, like verify this stuff. Get someone who knows the language or transcribe it yourself, figure out the kanji, do not trust me 100% on this. Just, that's what I think is true. And I know that with these set, then my external sound card works properly. Um, and with these not set, then I use the internal sound. So, yeah, we're gonna escape from there now. And yeah, with no floppy drives in, it will boot to the hard drive um, if I let it, after the SCSI controller initializes. So we're gonna do that. SCSI controller takes a while. Oh yeah, SCSI configuration, right. So control graph L, like I mentioned way long, long time ago now, it feels like. Yeah, control graph L um, brings you into this screen. But if I do that with the other keyboard, um, so, okay, now I have the NEC board plugged in. Control graph L. Oh yeah, I held control and graph too early, so it went into here. Uh, wait a moment. Control graph L. And the reason this doesn't work is because, uh, well, my guess for why this doesn't work is that um, the 9801V keyboard wants um, a ready signal to be sent by the system, by the host system, after each byte is received. And um, this um, BIOS program for initializing the SCSI controller doesn't send that ready signal. It's like once it's out of there, um, it should work fine, I think. Shouldn't it? Let's try starting it without without that, um, without any buttons held down. Just to confirm that it normally does work and it's just not in that screen. This board also has um, been a little bit flaky sometimes with uh, <coughs> registering key presses on certain keys. Um, I got it basically in junk condition, but it looked really clean in the picture, and it is really clean. Okay, yeah, so that works. I can select the boot drive there. And it loaded, so there you go. Um, and I can even boot Windows. In 640 by 400. Hmm. Nice and loud. Uh, yeah, so... <clears throat> there's our um, Windows settings, or Windows screen. 
And um, that was the 86 card that you heard making that bah, bah, noise just now. So I'm going to reset this because I don't need to be in Windows at all. Actually, I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to plug in the other keyboard and show you the SCSI controller um, screen again. I think I might have found one or two DOS games that also do not um, work correctly with the 981V keyboard, but I was having other issues at the time, so that could be a mistake. Uh, okay. So yeah, once the RAM test starts, you can hold Control Graph and it won't shoot you straight into the BIOS settings. Yeah, Control Graph L with this board gets you right in here. And like, I can page up and down and do whatever. But even here, if I swap the keyboard out, and you probably shouldn't do hot swapping like I'm doing, um, but like even here, if you swap the keyboard out, you get nothing. And then you swap it back, and it works. So yeah, it, it's just totally that something like that happening. Bad code by um, Logitech without the H. Um, yeah, so this is where you can enable certain drive IDs. So like here I have um, a drive, an artificial drive hosted on a Zulu SCSI card um, called FMP, Big FM, and just a DOS one. And then this right here is actually an optical drive that's being emulated um, over the SCSI bus. So, yeah. Um, also, if you're having trouble with it, um, make sure that it's not in the magneto optical mode, which is this setting. Uh, my card was in this mode when I got it, so the previous owner was probably using magneto optical drives with it, which are awesome, by the way. But um, yeah, they they um, they will cause issues potentially if you're trying to load from a hard drive. So I'm going to oh, and this is where you set the IRQ. When I had it set to this one. Um, Toho 3 and 4 did not work, or maybe it was 4 and 5, I, I forget. Um, so yeah, um, the top one is the ROM address. Uh, okay, so we're going to hit save. And then here it's asking me to hit the reset key. So I'm going to turn it off instead of hitting reset. Haha. <laughs> and I'm going to plug in the keyboard I prefer to use. much more comfy with this board most of the time it's also larger but there's space here between the arrow keys and the enter keys so I haven't accidentally hit those as much it's just a more enjoyable experience it's also a nice linear keyboard for anyone interested in mechanical boards Yeah, it's getting dark out there now. Okay, yeah, so we're in this screen again. Oh yeah, so I was going to actually demo some software now. Um, I'm using two GoTech drives. Uh, one thing to note about these GoTechs is that um, you have to change at least one or two settings um, on the GoTech uh, compared to the defaults for it to work correctly. Um, on the Epson at least, I think. I'm not sure about it and everything else. But um, I think in order to swap another drive into here, like another floppy drive, you would actually need um, to have like a logical inverter or like a transistor and resistor or else like an actual um, not gate integrated circuit to negate one of the signals coming out of the drive, which in my case is the density signal. So I'm moving the mic just a little bit away from the keyboard. It's still going to be loud, though. Sorry. Um, yeah, so actually, let's open this in Emacs. Okay, so the things to take note of here, I'll actually increase the font size too. 
Okay, so the things to take note of here, I changed the interface to JP, PC, HD out. You might not need to do that. You might be okay with Shugart, but IBM PC will not work. So try Shugart and try JP, PC, HD out. JP, PC, HD out means it sends out the high density signal. Um, and according to pinouts I found online, this, this drive does do that. Um, oh, by the way, the drive in question the model number, in case you want to find the original drive, is, uh, let's see, actually I'm forgetting right now what it is, and it's not listed on here, but it starts with the MD, and it's made by Canon, like the, like the photography company. Um, MD301, uh, 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 35, I think it's on my blog, maybe. Uh, no, it's not actually, but I bet the pinout uh, thing is 22 matches for the word pinout. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, MD3541G was the part number, and yeah, I found the pinout somewhere on this site, I think. Although I forget exactly where. Huh. I know there's a pinout somewhere on here, but yeah, the MD3541G is. what I was looking for. Huh. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out here. Um, sometimes it's just hard to find it all. Oh, here we are, maybe. It's a table like this, at least, but I guess this isn't actually the page. Whatever. Um, I can do this. Yeah, here we are. This is the page. Yeah, so um, this uh, this just has all the pinouts in the table here uh, for various drives. Very handy. And um, there is a NOT gate on the um, on this card. I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's focus in on that. Yeah, so uh, this transistor here uh, and this resistor here, I believe are forming a NOT gate to invert the density pin um, on that breakout board, but I'm not sure about that. I, I'm guessing that the drive itself is actually outputting the correct density signal, and then the Epson is expecting an inverted one. It's a mystery to me. But what I do know is that what seems to work is setting the um, pin 0 2 equals n dense, um, which means negated density, because pin 2 it has the density signal on the 34 pin connector, not on the 26 pin connector that's um, listed on the site. But yeah, um, so logical complements of the density mode. And. Um, you should be able to leave 34 at auto because um, 34 under JPPC should be um, the ready connector signal and um, that's already the that's already there on JPPC HD out um, also it's on the shoe guard setting so anyway I'm using mostly HFE files for this that window 
All right, gonna plug these drives in finally, or these, yeah, these USB drives in. And um, we're gonna show you a game. And you'll get to hear the FM going. You'll see a sort of early example of PC-98 graphics from before the um, enhanced graphic controller or whatever it was called. Um, it's, it'll be fun. Um, so yeah, I'm going to reset this thing and whenever there's floppy drives inserted it'll try to boot from them and these gotex are configured correctly to um let you boot from them the one game i haven't gotten to work quite properly is ease it boots but it has all sorts of bugs and i'm wondering if it's anti-piracy code i'm running into i don't have a physical floppy drive here so i can't use my five and a quarter inch copies of ease Got to turn that down so it doesn't cause microphone feedback or something, or like echoing as badly. This is Emerald Dragon, by the way. I don't know if I should be narrating over this or not. So this is where a shipwreck... Um, so basically, dragons fought this war in their homeland and um, lost and were cursed and had to leave their homeland or suffer from that curse. And this is after uh, shipwrecks in the dragon's new home. Uh, there's a girl aboard who survived and is taken in by the dragon clan. Atrushan, who's one of the main characters. The other one is Tamarine, who's the green haired girl. I didn't stick around any longer than it did. I do really enjoy this game. So this is years later. Um, Tamarine has um, grown up. 
and um, is deep in thought. She basically wants to um, leave and go be with humans, other humans. She's telling Atrushan basically that she's sorry and like that she um, wishes that she could have it both ways. Um, not have to give up what she has, but she feels like she does need to go live with people. I don't know all of what's being said here. I've not bothered to try to translate it all. This is my rough understanding from the SNES version of the game, to be completely honest. Which is rather markedly different. From the parts of this game I did translate, though, it's very story-oriented. But it is an RPG once it gets going. Atrushan just broke off his horn and is telling um, Tamardine to um, blow into it if um, she's ever in trouble, and he'll come to help her. And here's just a big bad villain guy. Uh, basically, the land is under attack by big bad evil villain. Some good music coming up. So I'll try not to talk too much. So she's playing on the horn. Also, this is a weird game where, um, so there's three discs for the game. There's, um, the game disc, the, um, user disc, which is where you save your game data and stuff. And I think there's other game data also on there. Um, and then there's an intro disc, which just contains that opening, as far as I can tell. So now it's telling me to, um, pop in, um, disc one in the first drive, like the game disc, and then the second one, um, so, okay, so they're calling the first one the system disc, and the second one, um, I think that's, that's, um, yeah, that's day, day, data, okay, so yeah, so the, the, the first disc is the system disc, and the second one is the data disc, so they want you to put drive one, um, system disc, second drive, data disk. Um, so now if I put those in and I hit reset and I wait for the SCSI controller to initialize again 
you can have this keyboard plugged in during boot up, it doesn't matter. You can still set up the main BIOS settings, but like, as long as you don't need to enter the SCSI, like, controller setup screens, you should be fine with uh, the mechanical board. None of my other cards have had trouble ish troubles either, it's just that one. Alright. Oh yeah, and um, we need to turn the speed down. There we are. So yeah, um, this is running at the minimum speed now. You might have noticed the power light change color. Uh, so like there's green, there's yellow, and there's red. And um, red is the lowest setting, yellow is the middle setting, and green is the highest setting. So there's just a visual indicator of the speed that your system is currently set to run at. Um, with the stock 25 megahertz CPU, that equates, I think, to like either five or ten, five or eight megahertz, um, then ten megahertz, and then 25. But with the 75 um, megahertz one, I'm not sure what it's doing. So. In any case, some games are way too fast. This one is relatively well throttled most of the time to um, like actual frames being drawn. So it runs pretty much fine on a, on a 75 megahertz system. But, okay, yeah, so... But um, some games are not quite that fortunate. If you don't have the um, data disk in and you talk to Tamarin here, then um, the system will freeze, so whenever you play a game that has multiple discs, it's a good idea, just as a general rule, to um, always put um, user disc in, and um, to always put, uh, well, put the game disc in and put the user disc or the second disc or whatever in um, when in doubt. So here, we're going to talk to Tamarin. And um, so currently, this guy is Atrushan in a sealed form. So he's unsealing himself here, but um, the curse is going to take a toll on him as he tries to do it. But he feels like he needs to be all theatrical and reveal himself to her because she doesn't recognize the human form that he's taken. And I just like a lot of the art for these games. As much as anything else, that's one of the reasons I like the idea of playing them. And it's also a good way to try to learn some Japanese. So yeah, they're talking about the Dragon's Curse. Lots of kanji. I can translate like one sentence per ten minutes, it feels like. But... <laughs> I guess I'm learning from it. <sighs> they even animate mouth movements. Yeah, so... It's a fun game, or fun visuals. The game itself isn't bad either. It's pretty easy to grind in and just not feel like like you hate yourself for the grinding you're doing. Which is more than I can say for a lot of games.
I do highly recommend getting a CRT if you can afford to. It makes a lot of difference. But an OSSC will do the trick for you if you want to use an LCD with it. And some LCDs will even just work with 24 kilohertz, but not all. And 24 kilohertz, by the way, I'm referring to the horizontal scan rate for the 400 line uh, mode. Basically how often it needs to draw a line per second is based on the vertical line count as much as anything else. So it's a combination of that and the vertical refresh rate that determine the horizontal scan rate. And most PCs would use like 31 kilohertz ish or maybe 15 kilohertz or 15 to 16 kilohertz ish, not 24. And there's kind of a dead zone where the monitors can't handle it for the most part. Even my Amiga monitor doesn't handle it, but I think maybe the Commodore 1950 would handle it. You need a pin adapter still. Commodore 1942 does not. Also, mine has blown out capacitors again right now. kind of hate that thing. But I love when it works. It, it looks amazing when it works. The tube's in great shape, even if nothing else is. That'd be another fun one to do a video on, actually, because um, the Amiga Modder, like, it's been dropped before, I can tell, by a previous owner. There are bodge wires all over the place in there. And every time I open it up, it gets worse. That thing... That thing has no right to be alive, but I'm going to try to keep it alive. If I remember right, this is Atrashan saying he's going to like going alone or something, being all manly and um, and Tamardine is refusing to let him go alone. Oh, he's starting to hear about how he needs to find the Emerald Dragon. That's the thing that's in green there. And they don't know what the Emerald Dragon is. But... <laughs> Apparently the Dragon Elder said that they need to find that. And didn't specify anything more. Yeah, this game is three floppy disks and only two for most of the game, so... Pretty impressive how much they managed to pack into the, the disc, honestly. A lot of games you control the characters with the numpad, sort of like old IBM computers, um, before they had a dedicated arrow key cluster. Joystick also works for a lot of them, but most of the joysticks have two buttons, and they aren't wired up like um, Mega Drive or Genesis or Master System pads. So, like the second, this one of the two um, fire buttons won't work with that pinout. And I haven't figured out what the correct one is yet because I haven't looked hard enough. Um, what was it? I think it was Escape uh, Seven. Yeah, Load Nine. Yeah, so I have more characters in this game, but I'll show you a battle and then I'll stop messing around with Emerald Dragon after that. So I only move my character, which is Atrushan, the red-haired one. The rest are all kind of AI controlled. Or maybe not AI, but like, y you know what I mean. Character died. Great. Huh. <laughs> Lovely. Anyway. Yeah, so I guess I showed you a battle. <laughs> um, let's see now. What else can I do? Oh yeah. I can talk more about the hardware, I guess. Um, one second, though.
Uh, yeah, I should probably um, change the disc. Also, s flip the speed back up. Maybe just while I'm uh, working on this, I'll uh, open another game up, which I like. Or at least I like the media that the game is kind of a franchise licensee. I don't know what I'd call it. Of. Oh, and I need to change the clock speed way down for this. And it'll still run a little bit too fast at this speed. This is also an older game, so you're not seeing the full graphical capabilities of the system at all. Just to be clear. So yeah, this is just another game on the system, and it's Bubblegum Crisis, um, which is something that really touched me emotionally when I watched the um, OVA series. And so it was just cool to see that it had a game. Even if it was pretty early, so you didn't get like the full graphical splendor that the Night Gate was capable of. Or the full musical splendor. Although, I do have a real fondness for 8-bit looking systems and games and uh, this definitely has that kind of a vibe to it even though the PC-98 is a 16-bit system there's a lot of like crossover there IBM PC was 8-bit address bus wise but 16-bit data like internally anyway So I think the second one is saying the loaded disk.
Okay, and now I can show you just how ridiculous um, this thing runs when you have it set to the 75 megahertz. I'm just going to say to go out into the city, I guess. Okay, so here's normally walking at 8 megahertz, or maybe not 8. This is probably way higher than 8. Like 16 or 32, I, 16, 24, 32, I don't know. What I do know is that this is the lowest speed I can do it at with the CPU accelerator in. Now let's do the fastest. Hmm. Did the game just freeze up on me? Seriously? Huh. I think it did. I think I just made the game crash. By doing that. I'm stuck and I can't move at all. But yeah, you can see how fast this character is moving at max speed versus minimum. Yeah, so it's just ridiculous. And a lot of older games run into that problem, but most newer ones don't. Um, actually, wh while I'm doing this, I'll get into the setup screen so that I have time. So I'm going to um, just load like a sound demo disc, because East doesn't really run properly, but this sound demo does. And so you can just hear a little bit more interesting tunes from the FM chip. Oh, another thing to mention, um, the YM2203, which is the M26 sound thing, is mono only. And the line output on um, the Epson is in the front, so you have to have this flap open to use external speakers with it, or the line out in general and you only get mono sound. The 86 card is stereo though, so that is another reason the 86 card is a great thing to have. Or a system with the integrated 86 card, like my friend has. Um, she has a PC9821CE2. No, not bootable? Okay. Really? I don't know if I believe that. We'll try restarting that. If you're going to do the GoTech route, do yourself a favor and get one with a screen or add a screen to it. The little um, numerical display is useless when you have a bunch of disks and you're trying to organize everything. I tried to do that with my Amiga for a long time and eventually just gave up. Oh, okay. I know why this is. So I'll need to boot from the hard drive and then load the game off of the floppies, but the floppies are not bootable. Hard drive is another thing you really should consider getting. It will simplify things immensely, and some games require hard drive installation. And Windows does as well, so you'll just get a lot more use out of it if you have a hard drive. Um, either internal or external like I've got. And if you do external, I mean even if you do internal, if it's SCSI based then you get a SCSI bus you can extend. Um, the later models come with IDE drives built in, but in 1992 they didn't. Okay, so let's plug those in. Is B drive? No, B drive is still um. Yeah, that's another difference. Um, the PC ninety eight. Um, if you boot from a hard drive, that drive will be the hard drive will be letter A. A and B are not always the floppy drives. It depends on what you boot from. There we go.
And so this is like a Dojin or self-published setup disc, I mean like music disc that has their attempts to um, recreate the music from East, which are pretty good. And they made a venue that looks like um, the beginning of East, so when I first launched it, I said, oh, holy shit, this is just gonna work. And then it didn't, but... Also, it ran slower than the real thing at 8 megahertz. This is in-house music. Or like, non-related music. The main problem I've noticed with these songs, other than occasionally a note that's the wrong pit, I mean wrong, wrong uh, tone, or like tune, I don't know, like the wrong pitch for a specific note, um, is that things go a little bit fast sometimes. But overall it's a pretty good rendition. So a lot of this music was Yuzo Koshiro compositions, which explains why they're amazing, but... So I guess I'm not talking too much about the specs anymore, maybe I'm just showing things off now, but I guess I mainly covered the technical stuff that I was ready to talk about in this video. I'm sure I'll have more to talk about eventually. Like I didn't mention the MIDI stuff very much. Just kind of teased it. But audio-wise... I think I have basically everything that I would want.
All right, there we go. So I think I'm done with this one for now, as well. Um, yeah, so I guess things I didn't talk about too much are MIDI. Um, I didn't talk very much about um, what else. Apart from MIDI, there was SCSI, I guess I mentioned in some depth. Really, you should see this video as a companion to the blog post, um, but for basically everything, you should refer to the blog post because I got a lot more in depth on that thing. And I'm still working on the blog post, too, so um, whatever you see there isn't all that will ever be there. Like, um, I talk about how you can write a floppy disk from um, a Linux system, like a modern Linux system, so that PC98 will read it. And this is something I um, helped my friend with, and my friend tested it, and it worked for her. Um, yeah, here's the stuff about the floppy drive adapter that I mentioned earlier. Oh yeah, I made a circuit board edge connector for something that I think will work, for an all-in-one like extender and adapter. So if you want to print that and let me know if it works, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I think it will. Um, yeah, editing config.sys, I talk about how you can do that and like how some SCSI drives that aren't NEC brand, like like CD drives especially, um, you can have trouble getting them to load and I talk about other drivers you can use to get around that. Um, They talk about different ways to get graphics. Oh yeah, here's what my um, PC monitor looked like uh, initially when I first received it versus after I cleaned the thing. So yeah, pretty gross. But it cleaned up very nicely. Yeah, I paid way too much in shipping on this thing, but... It was what was available on Yahoo Auctions at the time. So, that's what I went with. Anyway, it cleaned up nice, and now it works fine. Here's the bus mouse. I, I've even drawn up little pinouts and things for all the connectors. Or, not all the connectors, a lot of the connectors. Oh yeah, here's my sound sources. Um, so the Roland MT32, which I mentioned, and an SC55 um, variant, the Sound Canvas uh, 55. Um, this is a variant of the Mark II version of that, and um, it was meant for Kata OK, and it was only released in Japan. But um, yeah, so th that's what I have on the other step-down transformer that I mentioned forever ago, if you're actually um, still watching from then. <laughs> um, super long video, ain't it? Yeah, here's uh, the difference between the connectors that I mentioned. I tried to be very um, thorough about documenting everything. And I hope you can get some good use out of it. The printer connector, um, and also the mini Centronics thing that I mentioned, the other side of it on the SCSI controller. Um, me complaining about people in Japan who just say, oh, you should refer to this magazine that's copyrighted, and so I'm not going to share, like, the crucial details of it with you. Because you can just go to the Japanese National National Library and get a copy there for free, because you're all Japanese citizens, right? So yeah, just little, little things that annoy me. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I didn't really talk about the masking tape, but um, the masking tape that's on the uh, cover here there's big gaping holes in the sides because of the bezels on the original floppy drives being meant for like five and a quarter inch. This isn't actually a regular five and a quarter inch slot though. Uh, it's slightly narrower than that. So like when I bought five and a quarter inch to 3.5 inch bracket adapter things, they were too big, which really annoyed me. Anyway, um, yeah, so I've got that. Um, talk a little bit about corrosion. Yeah, you should definitely try to avoid um, when you're buying a model. Um, models that, like, 
if you know that they have like a nickel cadmium barrel type battery just try to avoid those unless they show you pictures of the board and show you that like there's no leakage or that there's bare minimal leakage that you can clean up easily because otherwise it'll just keep getting worse over time um, yeah things to look for are the enhanced graph controller um, apart from the enhanced graphic controller there's things like um, you should try to get one that supports high density floppies um, that has built in 86 sound or at least 26 sound but you may regret 26 sound if you just go with that it's like my system only has 26 sound so I definitely recommend an 86 sound card unfortunately they are rather expensive and I hope that that gets fixed, but the cards are quite complex, so um, I'm not especially surprised that no one's made um, reproductions yet. Although maybe someone could make one with an FPGA or two. Should simplify things a lot. Um, yeah, power converters, stock up the mouse. A lot of games don't need a mouse, but the ones that do, you'll you'll really be glad you have it. The adapter wiring and a visual illustration of the adapter wiring. And I guess I've got a bunch of useful links and things in here right now, and just a little list of translation table of sorts to help you for searching with things. English language and Japanese language links. Um, yeah, so overall. I really hope that um, you've gotten some use out of this video. Um, I'm probably not done with these. I'm going to make more videos like this. Maybe I'll edit them more. I don't know. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's a system I'm excited to have. That Oh, yeah, I could do Toho. That's something I could do, just to wrap things up. So, yeah, if I want to do that, I'll need... Um, to remove the floppies and set it to the highest speed that I can do. Um, Japanese people seem to say like 66 megahertz plus is what you need for um, Toho to run full speed, or like for all the Toho games to run at full speed. Um, so 75 is good, but yeah. Oh, and uh, the bus speed will be faster on a 66 megahertz one than it is on a 75 megahertz one, even if the CPU is slower just because the bus clock itself is higher. Um, 486 CPUs run at multiples of the bus clock speed. So like um, the bus clock for uh, mine is 25 megahertz and the CPU is 25 megahertz. The DX2 runs at 50 internally, but still is on a 25 megahertz bus. DX4 runs at three times um, the bus clock speed internally, but still runs at the original bus clock externally. So yeah, um, there's an argument to be made that a 66 megahertz one would be potentially faster in some situations, but um, it doesn't seem to matter much in this specific one. Okay, so now I'm going to restart and I'm going to let it boot to the hard drive because um, I think some of the Toho games can be played off floppy disks, but I don't have floppy disk images and good luck finding the originals. Especially at a price that is acceptable. Um, you, you probably just won't find one at an acceptable price, unless you're crazy, and what an acceptable price is to you is in the hundreds or thousands of dollars. Alright, so, my complaining about prices aside, by the way, I spent like over one and a half thousand dollars on this thing, including shipping, to get everything together, so... Like, I had almost none of this to start. I didn't even have a SCSI drive or a controller uh, or, like, this housing. So, like, I had to do everything. And then I also bought a sound canvas. Um, I ever had the MT32, at least. Um, like, controller cards and, like, expansion cards that didn't come with the thing. All these had shipping from Japan on them, and I didn't order them all at once. I got murdered on shipping on the CRT itself. Like, absolutely slaughtered. So, like, I paid about ten times what I what I spent on the monitor in shipping 
So like that's thirty dollars plus three hundred in shipping. And my friend did get one significantly less than three hundred dollars in shipping. Um, and I think my mistake was having the proxy the proxy buyer that I was using um, do the safety wrapping stuff on it instead of just getting insurance and not having them repackage it because um, they put it in a huge amount of foam, which did keep it very safe, but um, also made the price eye-wateringly high. I was hoping to save some money by buying the cheaper monitor, but <laughs> didn't end up working out that way. Um, so yeah, um, be warned, it's a money pit for sure. Oh, and uh, each of these GoTech drives is like another 50 or something. Um, thankfully, I already had the higher speed CPU, but um, I would be happy with just the 25. That's all I was expecting when I bought it. I um, had to buy the keyboard. Well, I didn't have to. I had a keyboard that came with it, the Epson one, but I like this keyboard more. Um, what else did I have to get? I got a scaler so I could do this video and like capture the video output um, from the thing and a VGA distribution amplifier and an HDMI splitter and just a whole bunch of stuff involved in getting this together. Um, but I'm very happy that I have it now and hopefully it'll last a while. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think I was going to do Toho. Right, so, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was having trouble CD into those folders because I don't know how to type the kanji from DOS. Um, so I ended up, like, doing a directory listing, redirecting that to a file, then editing the ba file into a batch file that CD'd into the folder I wanted. So... That was fun. Um, so I gave some good music, by the way. That's one good thing about them. I guess the first one doesn't use the 86 sound, just 26 sound maybe. Also it's a very different game than the rest are. I think the first game is by far the most interesting of the lot, but I do want to get used a demo of some good music and stuff, so I'll probably play one of the others. But yeah, the first two or three games would work with the uh, interrupt setting wrong on um, the <laughs> SCSI controller. But four and five, I think, would not. So, yeah, like I said, fun to figure that one out. Why two of them just went to like a black screen versus the others working flawlessly. When no one else seemed to be having that problem. Then again, almost no one else has my setup. Yeah, there's a lot of FUD out there just about the Epsons, actually. Um, people who don't know what they are, like, like people who are into the PC-98 and have heard about the Epsons but were too afraid to buy one and, like, spend the money on one to know if they were compatible or not because they didn't know if they were compatible. And so they just warned everyone, oh, I don't know if these are compatible, so maybe uh, be careful. Like, maybe think twice about buying one and... They mean well, but it definitely ends up being causing fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is part of why I decided to go with the Epson, because I wanted to prove everyone wrong. Because I did not see any documentation online of people saying they had actual real compatibility problems with the Epson, like even in Japanese. And so it just felt silly to me. 
to be spreading that kind of uncertainty, spreading that kind of uncertainty when there is documentation and stuff out there, mostly in Japanese, that it works. Um, let's see, we can try four maybe. The key map, the keyboard layout is also something you need to get used to. Um, quotation mark on the two key with shift, of course. Um, that, that's like old ANSI keyboards, actually. So that's actually, before IBM, basically everyone did that. The Commodore 64 had that there, so that's not too bad. Um, asterisk is over here on the colon key, which is a little strange. There, there are some things to like watch out for when you're trying to learn to type on these things. But overall, I've adapted relatively well. Okay, what's it saying? Probably saying that I don't have enough memory. So there's a workaround for this, as usual. The workaround is stupid, but it definitely works, which is boot from an external DOS floppy. That one is the EMS DOS floppy that I prepared. So that one should be using expanded memory and um, loading the high mem driver and whatever. Ugh. So hopefully this one is the one I needed to boot from in order to make it work. Because the config.sys on the hard drive is definitely set up for um, a slightly heavier weight experience and for running things like Windows. SCSI drivers load, lots of stuff like that. Um, now I just have to wait. Even with an emulated floppy, it has the floppy drive speed problems somewhat. It's like a really clean floppy disk drive in terms of the speed. Um, Here we go. So yeah, that's all it was. <coughs> I just needed to um, give myself some more RAM. So here's what it sounds like um, with the 26 sound, roughly. Which is good and all. And then here's the 86 sound. And the music player is a cool screen as well.
There's also some really nice demo music discs out there that just contain music. Um, the FMP collection is like eight or nine discs, and it's pretty fun to look through. You get some really great tracks. A lot of them are covers of songs from other games and stuff, but yeah. So let's try a game, even though I suck at this game. I, I suck at shooters in general. Yeah, so a lot of stuff happening really fast for, like, not having hardware sprites. It's a nice thing that it, um, that the game is um, good enough to let you do diagonals with. Um... Fuck. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's nice that the game lets you do diagonals with the uh, keypad. It's um, so, like if I hit the nine key, I go diagonally, or I can just hit like up and right and also go diagonally. That's the special attack that I was forget I can do. Oh, so that's the X key, and I'm just using my special attack on nothing. That's great. Alright. But well, yeah, I can use the X key instead of the space bar. That's the big takeaway. Dialogue I can't read, because... Well, maybe I could, but I'm not spending the time to try to do it. Uh, especially since I know nothing about Toho. I said that it's a shooter game, and that it does require pretty high performance. Yeah, but um, this is running at about twice the frame rate you're seeing, because I'm recording this at 30 FPS, but the game is running at closer to 60. Shit. There we go. Joystick would be really useful here. <sighs> Actually, I have a joystick, and it sort of works. But I have to—I'll have to hold my hand on the keyboard for the fire buttons, so it's only sort of useful. Oh, that's another thing you get with the uh, sound card, by the way. Um, joystick is not something that like there's a port for on this. Some later PC-98s, at least the um, NEC ones, let you connect a joystick through the mouse port if you use a special adapter. Um, I have that adapter for mine and it doesn't work on it, so at least for the PC-486 you'll need an actual sound card if you want to connect a joystick to it, I think. Or there are some game pads and maybe joysticks that connect through the keyboard port that you can customize to send any keystroke you want. And then, like, you can chain the keyboard onto the front of that, so, like, it sits in between the keyboard and the system. So you can have both the keyboard and the controller connected at once, and that's really nifty. And I'm thinking about getting one of those, because those sound really cool. Anyway.
which, by the way, I mean, it's not perfect for this system because, like, even though it has two buttons on it, they're both wired up as one fire button, and that one fire button is the one that does the special attack. So it's uh, not exactly ideal. But like, for other systems, it's amazing. Like for the Amiga, it's the best joystick I've used. For the Atari 2600, best joystick I've used. Unless uh, we're including things like gamepads. In which case, um, I'd probably go to the Japanese version of the Mega Drive um, six button controller this, um, as opposed to the American one, which is ever so slightly fatter, but, um, anyway, that aside, um, the fire buttons are still not wired up right for any of those buttons to work either, um, okay, but yeah, the tack joystick, I, I do love this thing, uh, for most systems, let's see if I can make it, um, do what I want it to. Yeah, this might work. We'll see. No. Yeah, it's nice and tight joystick, so you don't have to put a ton of, um, a ton of, fuck. You don't have to put a ton of effort into, um, like, tilting it in either direction. I'm gonna put it on my mouse pad though. It could use like a weight or some suction cups or something to try to hold it down. Some other joysticks use suction cups. I have other joysticks as well, which I think could be good, but most of them need fixing, and I've not done that yet. So, um, like, my. I have a Comrex joystick under my table right here, which. Feels like it could be fantastic, but it really needs some work. And I tried to open it up, and it's not an easy joystick to work on. Uh, this is sort of working. It's so shitty, though. One thing I could do is try to figure out what the grounding point is. And if I could figure out what the grounding point was, then I could, um, like, just try jumping wires to each of the pins between them and ground until one of them works. Okay, so we're going through there, going through there. Uh, okay. Okay, there it goes. Thank God. Oops, I hit the fire button on the joystick. Did the special attack. Not something I meant to do. This is putting a lot of stress on my arm, just because I'm trying to hold the joystick down while I do this. You just can't win. That's the conclusion I'm coming to. I mean, if I could just hold this in my hand, it'd be awesome. Maybe I could rewire this, I, I don't know. Like, make it so both fire buttons act differently from each other, and... Like, I'd probably have to get a new cable for that, but if I could do it, then, um... Okay. Another Toho Girl boss fight. I've taken apart the TAC tube, by the way, and it's a really nice joystick internally to work on, relatively speaking. Um, actually, here's my cramping solution. Even though I love the idea of using a joystick for this game. <sighs> someday. Someday, my child. This controller sometimes has a problem where one of the buttons doesn't work 
quite right. Um, if you're sorry, if you're not, um, if it's not plugged in at just the right angle or whatever, I don't know. Um, this controller, like the left direction, won't work. But we'll see if that uh, happens to me. Uh, okay, no, this is gonna work. Um, except. I need to move where the keyboard is. <laughs> this is getting terrible. Okay. <laughs> um, shit. Already dead. Um, but yeah, the D-pad here, this is working better. It's a lot tighter too. Damn it. Now I'm too responsive. Keyboard it is. We're back to keyboard. Okay. Shit. Okay. 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 was a slowdown. <laughs> well, I can just I can just hold the space button. Okay. Oh, that's good. I might change a lot actually. I have to be like playing a keyboard or a piano keyboard or something in order to ah shoot. Like, you can probably see how this would be hard on a computer with no sprites to run at, like, slower CPU speeds. So I, it's actually really impressive that this game runs as well as it does. Or at least to me it is. I mean, even with 75 megahertz to work with, it's quite a lot to keep track of. And the fact that the music is good on top of that. I sort of can understand some of the appeal of Toho. Uh, okay. Rock. like this. Oh, shit. 
I mean, I'm bad at it, but I still think it's cool. Ah. Uh, okay. <gasps> Damn it! <laughs> ah, bullet hells. Freaking bullet hells. I guess you're supposed to be able to tell from the shape of the bullets what their firing pattern's going to be and anticipate based on that. Ah, there we are. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> the second round, of, my brain wasn't ready for it. Oh. Ah, dead already. What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> Dang it. Okay. Uh, looks like I'm gonna be able to do enough characters for my name, maybe? Uh... Plus one, I guess. There we go. Yeah, so... I think I'll probably call it there. But, um... Yeah. Pretty neat little system. I'll probably do more in the future. Maybe I'll, I'll split this up and I don't know how I'm going to edit this thing. Like, do I just keep all the footage together or should I like split it up into the technical parts and just me fucking, fucking around with video games or like, what should I do? Anyway, um, I hope you had some fun or like had some enjoyment out watching this. I had fun, but like, it's a lot easier for me to have fun than for other people to have fun just listening to me monologue <laughs> um, without a script or anything. Well, I hope you enjoy it though. And um, do let me know in comments if you watched any of this, if you hear me say this. Um, well, definitely let me know if you hear me say this because I'm interested to know if anyone is actually listening. If it's just kind of background noise or just like seek to three minutes in, watch two minutes and leave. But yeah, I want this to be entertaining and useful for a lot of people. Um, so let me know what I can be doing better, and, I mean, yeah, I'll see you when I see you. <laughs> and, yeah, bye for now, I guess. Um, have a good one. Um, good luck. If you get one of these, just know it's a money pit, but it's a pretty fun money pit. And you'll learn a lot <laughs> in the process. My friend, with all the computers, um, I've been... Like, she's been learning a ton, too, and it's been really fun to watch her learn stuff and to learn along with her. But, okay, so that's it for now. Um, have a good rest of your night or day or whatever time it is. Um, have a good rest of eternity, and um, maybe I'll see you guys later. Bye for now. Oh, wrong keyboard. <laughs> Bye for now.